Welcome back to CurrentAds.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, The Case for Free Speech, with John Stuart Mill. In this video, we're going to be looking at what is the harm principle. This video is going to kind of start off our series by looking at John Stuart Mill's harm principle and how we can define that in terms of free speech and four arguments that he offers for it. So, in his book, On Liberty, John Stuart Mill provides a strong and vehement defense of radical free speech. The governments of even most liberal democracies have more restrictive laws on freedom of speech than Mill would have advocated. The reason the viewpoint still holds sway is that there is one country that's an outlier that holds fairly closely to Mill's principle, the United States. To clarify just how radicals Mill's views are, here are a couple of quotes from On Liberty. There ought to exist the fullest liberty of professing and discussing as a matter of ethical conviction any doctrine, however immoral it may be considered. Basically, he's saying that no matter how immoral your ideas are, we should have no prohibitions from the government on discussing or talking about them. Whether that's killing babies or what have you, there should not be a prohibition on discussing them and talking about them. Mill also says, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of a, the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person then he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. So this is just to emphasize, Mill is saying, even if there's a single person on earth who holds an opinion, and every single other person on earth holds a different opinion, it's not just that the earth doesn't have a right to silence that person, it's that their right to silence that person would be just as justified as that person claiming to have a right to silence every single other person in the world. It doesn't matter how many people hold your view or how few. You still have a right to speak and you have no right to silence others. So this video looks at the principle that Mill uses to determine when a government is justified in impinging on free speech and the arguments for his claim that all other impositions are immoral. The principle at the center of the argument is known as the harm principle. So, although Mill frames his discussion of free speech in terms of rights as a good, and as, as a good and arguably the original utilitarian, he's really concerned about harm to others. Therefore, he provides one and only one situation in which free speech can be impeded. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So, you can stop someone from exercising their freedom of speech or expression if that would prevent harm to others. Now, taken by itself, it's difficult to say just how permissive such a principle is. Many people claim to be harmed by the statements and opinions of others. They say, oh, your statement offended me, so I was harmed. So in that way, we might interpret this as being very restrictive of free speech and saying, if something you say has any chance of hurting anyone or offending them, it's problematic. Fortunately, Mill makes clear exactly what he means by such a statement and provides us with an example that hopefully clarifies that he's not just talking about things that you might be offended by. In fact, he's going much further in his provisions for free speech. Essentially, harm in this sense only comes in the form of incitements to direct illegitimate action. So Mill makes clear that the type of harm he is talking about comes out of actions, not words. And words only may count as causing harm when they are direct incitements to harmful action. You can say that all moderate politicians are horrible people, but you can't tell a sniper with a gun pointed at a moderate politician to shoot that politician because they deserve to die. As you can see, one of those, the harm that a moderate politician might feel is being caused by the words. And that's not a harm that Mill cares about. In the second case, 
the harm is being caused by an action, namely someone shooting someone, and your words directly and immediately causing that happening. It's not some long indirect thing of you said something once that inspired someone to eventually believe that they need to kill someone. No, it's the direct immediate action, not some long indirect chain of events. It has to be direct and it has to be the action that causes harm, not the words themselves. The example that Mill provides is of a corn dealer. One may express the opinion that the corn dealer starves the poor and steals foods out of their mouths in print or in a discussion with people. However, to yell it to an angry mob outside the house of a corn dealer with pitchforks and knives would be prohibited, as it would incite them to harmful action against another. As we go through these examples in the videos to follow, keep this in mind. What Mill is prohibiting, the only thing he's prohibiting, is words that immediately cause harmful actions. According to Mill, Unless speech is directly inciting harmful action, it should not be prevented by the government. Now that we have a sense of what Mill's position is, let's look at the arguments he offers to defend it. Now, I'm relying solely on Mill's work in On Liberty, which is a great text and a wonderful book if you want to check it out. We're going to cover four arguments that he offers here in that book and in that text. But there are other arguments that he and others have offered, but we're just going to focus on those main four, of why even the most offensive and immoral opinions should be allowed and permitted by a government. First, the first argument that Mill offers is particularly persuasive to the skeptics out there. Basically, it's an appeal to our epistemic fallibility. No opinion should be criminalized because it might be true. And because we don't have perfect knowledge about everything, we can't know that any opinion, no matter how horrible we think it is, isn't simply false. There are many things once thought heinous, which have later been widely accepted. Women wearing pants was thought immoral at one time and thought a horrible thing to even talk about and in some cultures still is. But many people have come around to the idea that it's okay for women to wear pants. And so by oppressing that opinion alone, the problem is that you're oppressing something that will eventually lead you to the truth, or at least what we accept these days is the truth. By outlawing dissent, you prevent society from being able to test new ideas and further its goal of eventually getting to the truth. You never know what you might be wrong about. And as a skeptic, I have plenty of arguments to make that case, for at least that premise, that you don't know that X opinion is wrong. Everyone might think the Earth is the center of the universe, but if you outlaw any other opinion, you'll never learn differently. Second, the second argument is something of an incrementalist version of the first. Basically, it claims that even if an opinion is mostly false, there may be some grain of truth hidden within it. Now, that grain of truth can exist in a couple ways. You might have an opinion which is broadly offensive, but has some premises that are true that people don't generally accept. And if you dismiss the view all out because the conclusion is offensive, you may miss the fact that one of those premises in there is actually true and is not something that many people access, except, once again, in the furtherance of our pursuit of truth. But another example of this might be one ethnic group might have an offensive opinion that another ethnic group is thieving cockroaches, say. Even if this is false, preventing them from expressing that opinion may obfuscate the real problems of, say, a lack of economic opportunities for that first ethnic group, or structural discrimination favoring the second group. They may be wrong that any people are cockroaches, but they may be right in that they're expressing their frustration and perhaps they're expressing it badly, but by forcing them into silence, we never as a society or a government hear that frustration or come to understand that there is deeper simmering dissent that exists in that society. Punishing those that express this opinion hides that grain of truth that they are being oppressed even if the conclusion that they end up drawing is false. The third argument is about understanding. Even if the minority opinion or the oppressed opinion that the government's trying to censor 
is wholly false by forcing people to proclaim the opinion of the majority without coming to that conclusion themselves. That conclusion is itself weakened, and so are the people. If people believe the truth simply because they are told it, they will believe a lie just as easily. If, however, they come to understand the reasons for it by understanding how the arguments against it fail, they will not blindly accept anything put in front of them, but rather seek to understand the reasons for a claim and why objections fail. Basically, the point here is that in order for something to move forward and for something to be tested and truly understood by a people, they need to understand the arguments against it and understand why it's successful in defeating those arguments. If they accept it on blind faith, they'll accept anything on blind faith, and such a society is quite dangerous. Fourth and finally, the fourth main argument that Mill offers for this position is that if a particular belief is forced on the public, they will have no reason to fight for it or hold it tight. Imagine a belief that is in fact true, and the opposition opinions are false and are dangerous opinions even. If people are forced to believe it, and all opposition opinions are forced into silence under threat of penalty of law, of a fine or a jail imprisonment. Important positions, that important position will lose its force because it will need no defenders. When people believe that there is no opposition to a righteous opinion, they stop fighting for it, and therefore forget often why that opinion was important in the first place, or the harms that could come of actually acquiescing to the opposite view. This can lead to people forgetting why it was important to fight for that opinion in the first place. The point is to keep a position healthy, one must have a certain amount of healthy skepticism and healthy objections that come along every so often to poke at it and say, why do we really believe this? Can you show me that? Can you prove it? If you completely eliminate all possible dissent, no one comes along to poke and say, is this really true? And that's problematic. Because inevitably, then no one fights for the original opinion. And so when someone is able to push through that oppressive government and say, no, really, we want to overturn this idea, no one knows why they held that idea. They just held it because they were told to. Some final thoughts. In the remainder of this series, we're going to be looking at how this principle can be applied to current debates about free speech and whether these arguments hold up in the face of current objections to this very wide-ranging idea of free speech. It's noteworthy that these topics are controversial, inherently, because we're talking about what you can and can't say, and may ironically lead to some videos in this series being demonetized or censored, despite the series itself being about censorship. If anyone from the YouTube team is watching this, if any of these videos are demonetized or censors, we will definitely add a video to the end of the series on free speech versus YouTube, specifically looking at demonetization as a method of censorship. Even if they aren't demonetized, we might add it anyway. Let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in that. And as we have done with other controversial videos, we're going to publish these as premieres every other week, at 2 p.m. GMT. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook if you're interested in the exact announcements or for information about those times changing. I will be online in the chat to answer any specific questions as those videos go up. We may, as it gets around the holidays, we may move things around, so it might not always be every other week, but that's what we're gonna shoot for of doing every other week and alternating with another type of video. Next up, we're going to be looking at John Stuart Mill versus abstinence-only education, specifically looking at the ideas of how free speech and the arguments for free speech can be applied to the claim that you should limit the information that people are given or the facts that you provide people because who knows what they would do to them. Watch this video and more here at cardeides.org. And as always, stay skeptical, everybody.